Good morning. This recording is for November 24th, and uh, we're going to depart from our regular study of the book of Revelation. I'm doing a little different study today. There's no Bible study tonight at our hall uh, so that people can travel and prepare for Thanksgiving meal and so on. But uh, we're doing video instead, and uh, we're going to be talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit. So let's, let's go to prayer. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you, Lord, that you have come and offered yourself for us a sacrifice, that we don't have to be punished for our sins. You took the place for our punishment, and we thank you, Lord, for our salvation. Then you offer us eternal life. Simply by believing on you and following you, we have eternal life. We thank you, Lord, for this study. We pray, Holy Spirit, direct this study about you, about the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to blow the shofar and get into our study. Before the, before the Lord left, he said he was going, he's leaving to go to the Father. He's going to prepare a place for us. In John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14, in uh, verse 1, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I, grow, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to the Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So our Lord now, at this point, the Lord, is, he has ascended, He's, he's in, in the Father's presence. He's preparing a place for us. But he, before he left, see, this all follows the pattern of the Jewish wedding ceremony. There's a, a promise made, uh, a, promise, a promise of marriage. Uh, the Lord is called the bridegroom. The church is called the bride. And before, uh, before the wedding, the bridegroom goes back to his father's place and prepares a place for his bride. And be, but before he leaves, he gives a gift, a gift as a promise. Uh, it would be similar to what we do today with engagement ring. An engagement ring would be a, a, a gift of promising marriage. Well, the Lord's gift to us is the gift of the Holy Spirit. So after he left, he told his disciples that he would give them this gift, this promise of the Father. And so he goes to the Father's house. He prepares a place for us. He, he leaves us with that gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he said he would come back. He says, uh, and, and I will come again, verse 3, and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. At, 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 at the point when the Father decides it's time, he tells the bridegroom to go get his bride. The Father says there you have everything ready for your bride now go and bring your bride uh the marriage it's time for the marriage and you have a place prepared for you and and your bride and so that's why in the scriptures it tells us no one knows the day the hour uh, uh only the father not the the lord jesus doesn't know the angels in heaven don't know the day or the hour of the lord's return but he promised He's preparing a place for us now, and he will come back. But in the meantime, he left us, he left us that gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, we want to go to, uh, we want to, go to Matthew chapter 3, and uh, this, is the, this is John the Baptist speaking in chapter 3, verse 11. John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, speaking of Jesus, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And this is an awesome promise that John the Baptist is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. 
the, the person of the Holy Spirit is promised to come and live and dwell, and dwell in us. In the Old Testament times, the Holy Spirit would come upon the prophets, the judges, the kings, and they would speak or they would, uh, like Samson, perform mighty acts and so on, and then the Holy Spirit would depart. But in these church days, since the cross of Christ, the promise of the Holy Spirit is to come and dwell in us forever and ever. It's not, the Holy Spirit will not come upon us and leave. The Holy Spirit will abide with us. And this, this term fire, uh, this is awesome because it says he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, fire is a symbol of power, uh, energy, but it's also a symbol of purification. So the Holy Spirit is helping the bride get ready for the bridegroom. A bride doesn't show up uh, to a wedding in, in sweaty gym clothes or after working on her car or whatever. Uh, the, bride is, the bride is washed, clean, uh, uh, perfumed, uh, pure, ready for the wedding. And this is, this is exactly what the Holy Spirit is doing in the body of Christ in the church, uh, cleansing us, purifying us, uh, prompting us to repent of things that we, do, that we have in our life that we need to get rid of, be their sin, be their habits, addictions, whatever, uh, uh, whether there be uh, uh, unforgiveness, bitterness, uh, uh, hatred, things like that, that don't belong in the life of a believer. The Holy Spirit will prompt us to repent of those things and, and be free and be clean before the coming of the Lord. Now, uh, we want to go to... Um, this, this promise of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> was prophesied by the prophet Joel. And this is hundreds of years before the coming of the Lord. It says, the prophet Joel prophesied, and it shall come, come to pass afterward. Now, whenever that term afterward uh, is used, it's speaking about in the end times. It's speaking about the latter days, the end times. Whenever it says, and it shall come to pass afterward, this promise is for the church age. This promise is for, uh, it hadn't yet come, but this promise is for a latter time. And it says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy your old dreams. So shall, your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Also upon my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And what this is saying is that the promise or the gift of the Holy Spirit in the latter days, in the, in the late days of, of mankind on earth, will the promise of the Holy Spirit will come to all, uh, sons, daughters, old men, uh, maid, maid, men and maidservants. So not like in the Old Testament where only certain select individuals, uh, the Holy Spirit would come upon for a word or for a, for a mighty act. But in the church age, the Holy Spirit comes upon all men, all boys, girls, men, women, uh, elderly, everyone. And then uh, we want to go from there, uh, we, we want to go to the, the book of Acts. And let's go, let's go back to Acts uh, chapter, eight, uh, chapter 1, and uh, we'll, we'll read verses 4 through 8. In, in verse 4, and being assembled together, assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. So this promise was given by the Lord. Remember, John the Baptist said, Jesus will baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. It's important to remember that Jesus is the one who gives, he's the baptizer, he's the one who gives the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and says, and, and he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So this is, he's repeating what John said, that John baptized with water, and Jesus says, but you are going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. He told them to wait in Jerusalem, to tarry in Jerusalem. Uh, when we were on the tour in Israel, they took us up to that uh, upper room, and it's a, 
it's a it's a, a fairly large room. There were 120. Remember, there were 120 disciples in that room, uh, praying, seeking the Lord, and waiting for that promise of the Father. Therefore, in verse six, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, "Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel?" And he said to them, "It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in His own authority." So. The, the coming of the kingdom, Jesus coming back to earth to set up his kingdom, is it's all in the Father's plan. It's not for us to try to figure out exactly when it's happening and all of that. In, in verse 8, he says, But you shall receive power. Remember we talked about John said Jesus would baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Well, one of the elements of fire is power, energy. But you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. Now, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit does many things in the life of the church, in the life of a believer. But the number one pur purpose of the Holy Spirit, Jesus gives right here, and you shall be witnesses to me. He says, that's he's, you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit and power, and you're going to be witnesses to me. And he says, you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem in your hometown, in Judea, in the surrounding area, in Samaria. Uh, Samaria is interesting. Jesus throws that in there. You're going to be uh, witnesses to me in places that you wouldn't go, wouldn't normally go, and wouldn't want to go. Uh, Samaria was avoided by the Jews, remember? They, they didn't want to go through Samaria. They always went around it. And to the end of the earth, there'll be no limit to where you will go. Let me tell you a little story about Samaria. Uh, many times people will say, Lord, I'll do anything for you, but not this one particular thing. I really don't want to do that. We have a friend who's with the Lord now, but he, he had told the Lord, I'm willing to go wherever you want to send me, but Lord, don't send me to India. He didn't want to go to India. But it's, you know, it's there's poverty, there's sickness, there's... It's not real pleasant. It's hot. And, and he says, Lord, don't send me to India. Well, within uh, just a matter of weeks, he received an invitation to go minister in India. And when, when he got to India, not only was he blessed, but he loved it. He loved the people. He loved ministering. There were hungry hearts there ready to receive the gospel of Christ and he couldn't wait to go back. When he got home from India, uh, he lived down in Pasadena. Um, uh, he said he couldn't wait to go back to India. He says, uh, Jesus says, you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, your hometown, Judea, your surrounding area, Samaria, a place where you wouldn't normally go, and to the end of the earth. There'll be no limit to where the Lord can send you. So this promise is to every believer, not just to certain preachers or leaders or so on, but to every believer. And how do we receive the Holy Spirit? We, the Holy Spirit comes by invitation. The Lord is not going to force the Holy Spirit upon you, but the Holy Spirit comes by invitation. Begin asking the Lord to give you that gift of the Holy Spirit. If you've not experienced that infilling, that anointing, uh, it, it, so, to some it's very a very peaceful experience to others it's such a powerful anointing they can hardly stand uh, everyone's different don't tell people don't be religious and tell people if you didn't get it the way I did uh, if you didn't receive that gift exactly the way I did then then something's wrong with you you need to you need to receive the gift we can't we don't put God in a box and say he has to do it this way every time that's religion the Lord is um, he surprises us. He's inventive. He, he does things different with every individual. He knows you. He knows your personality. And he does it his way. His way is always the best way. Haven't you noticed that? When we try to do things our way, it doesn't work very well. And then let's go to Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> when the day of Pentecost, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord and in one place. Uh, this is this is important. They, there were 120 dis, uh, disciples, followers of Christ, in that upper room. 
And they were in there. Remember, Jesus told them to tarry, to wait in Jerusalem. Don't leave Jerusalem until you get that gift. Remember, Jesus didn't start his earthly ministry until the Holy Spirit came upon him at the baptism. When he, when he was baptized in the Jordan, the Holy Spirit came upon him. And after he got up out of the water and left, he, he, be, he went and he began to pray to the Father and he began his ministry. But he didn't begin without the power of the Holy Spirit. And it says uh, these disciples were seeking for 10 days for, from, from, uh, the, from the ascension of the Lord until the day of Pentecost. So this was 50 days after the Passover, the day of Pentecost. And they were all with one accord in one place. Now that's hard. It's hard to have 120 people in one room and to be in agreement, to be in one accord, one heart, one mind. It's hard enough. Uh, in, it's, ter it's terrible among people that don't know the Lord. It's hard enough even in the church to have 120 people in one room and to be in total agreement in one accord, one mind, one heart, one purpose. And this is what happened. Maybe it took them 10 days of praying to get to that point, but we, it, but we know from what it says here, they arrived at that place where they were in one accord, one heart, one mind, one purpose, uh, seeking the Lord, waiting for that promise. And when they were at that point and the day of Pentecost came about, it says in verse 2, then suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. This is important. There was, there was power from heaven. Can you imagine? They're in this upper room, and, and a storm, a wind storm, enters the room. This was not coming from outside. This was coming from heaven into the room where they were sitting. And then... Not only did the wind blow through there, but it says, then appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat on each of them. In uh, one of the translations, it says a large flame came into the room and separated, and one tongue of fire sat upon each of them. Can you imagine that? The, the wind had just blown through the room, and now this fire comes in, and little flames separate and rest above each one of them. It says there, then appeared to them divided tongues of fire and one sat upon each of them. And they remember John said they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, the fire is important because the, the fire represents power, represents cleansing, but the way the flame came into the room and then divided and rested upon each of them, this, this, is a, this is symbolic of the ministry of Jesus in the church. No one person, you have a lot of big shot ministries that think they have it all, but I'm telling you, no one person has all the ministry of Jesus. The ministry of Jesus has been divided and given to the church. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through chapter 14, uh, 13 is the love chapter, but in 13, that's, and that's sandwiched right between gifts and ministries, that's important. But you'll see in those chapters 12 and 14 how the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the ministries of the Holy Spirit are divided and given to individuals in the body of Christ. So no one person can walk about thinking, well, I have the whole ministry of Jesus. That's not true if they try to tell you that. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Now, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says tongues were a sign for the unbelievers. Now, this working of the Holy Spirit, this gift of tongues uh, in, in, in Acts chapter 2, it was a, was a tongue spoken in a, in, a, in a known language, but unknown to the speaker. They didn't know what they were speaking. As far as they were concerned, they were speaking in a heavenly language. But the hearers, those that were in the crowd were hearing, heard them speaking in their own language. So they, they did exactly what Jesus said. They waited in the upper room for 10 days. They prayed. They sought the Lord. They, they, came, they, they became in one accord in agreement. 
I'm sure there was fasting and prayer going on. I'm sure there were there was probably prayer for one another. Uh, there was healing taking place. There was some deliverance, people getting free from, from bad feelings toward one another, all these kinds of things. But they finally came to agreement, one accord, one mind, one purpose. And then the Holy Spirit descended upon them. Now, they obeyed the Lord. They didn't leave that upper room until they received the gift of the Holy Spirit, until they received the Holy Spirit and fire. And then at the, at, as they obeyed the Lord, they didn't go out and begin to minister until they received the power and the fire. And then in verse 5 and 6, And there, there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout men out of every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and they were confused because everyone heard them speaking in his own language. Remember, the, the disciples had no idea what they were speaking, but they were speaking in the language of these people. They were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? These, for the most part, they would, these were uneducated Galileans speaking in all these languages. In, in verse, in, in going on in verse 8, How is it that we hear each, of, each in our own language in which we were born? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretes, Cretans, and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So the first thing that happened on the day of Pentecost, they received the power of the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with the, these languages that they did not know. This was a sign to the, to the people in Jerusalem that were gathered there for the Feast of Pentecost. And it says, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. All, everything they were doing, everything they were speaking gave glory to the Lord. And men became believers. They, they, they believed on the Lord. Uh, and Peter gives a message, and uh, in, in, then in verse uh, 41, it says, Those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. The, this power of the Holy Spirit is to be a witness for the Lord and to draw souls unto him. And so we need this power of the Holy Spirit today, the day in which we live. Let's pray. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you for this promise of the Father. We thank you, Lord, that you went to prepare a place for us, but you left us that gift of promise that we are the bride of Christ and you will come back for us. We pray for those that are listening today, the body of Christ, to be fired up and to stirred up, stirred up, and to ask the Lord for this gift of the Holy Spirit. We need the, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the power. We need the energy. We need that flame in our life, cleansing flame in our life in these last days. And Lord, I pray if there's any watching right now to cry out to you, Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. Come into my heart and be Lord of my life. I believe that you died on that cross, were buried in that tomb, and rose again on the third day. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone.